Okay, folks, we're going to get started this afternoon. So let me start with good afternoon. Let me tell you, it is just terrific to see you all here this afternoon. The energy across the whole campus is just raised about 10 notches. So uh, we're going to begin today's fall 2016 Folsom Lake College Convocation with greetings from our Board of Trustees. And so it is going to be my honor to bring to the podium John Knight, a member of the Los Rios Community College Board of Trustees. Many of you know John, but if you don't, he's a long time public servant and community advocate, and he served on the El Dorado County Board of Supervisors, on the El Dorado County Fire Board, and he's also a member of our very own Folsom Lake College Foundation. Both of his children went to Oak Creek High School, and at Oak Ridge, sorry, it's a different high school. Oak Ridge High School, sorry about that, and attended a Los Rios College. So please give a warm falcon welcome. Notice he's got the teal tie to John Knight. Yeah, uh, Rachel got a uh, hold of my wife and told her what I needed to wear and how I needed to dress. But uh, thank you, uh, President Rosenthal, and it's always good to be here to welcome you all to the uh, 2016 fall uh, semester convocation. And it's always my pleasure to, uh, uh, you know, welcome you on behalf of the entire board. And, uh, and initially, we were going to have Kay Albiani uh, join me, but um, she wasn't feeling all that well. But for those of the that you don't know um, Kay, she will be retiring at the end of this year, and she has spent uh, 20 years uh, as a Los Rios trustee, and prior to that, she spent 18 years uh, on the Elk Grove um, uh, School District Board, so she had uh, that 38 years you know, experience, so we'll uh, miss her uh, tremendously. But uh, with that 20 years, I think just about every building here, when you see that plaque that you go in, um, her name's going to be on that. So she had a lot to do with, you know, as, as this campus developed. But uh, we will certainly miss her. And, and she was all, she was a uh, governor's appointee on the, on the trustee group. She was also um, um, part of the school boards association. So she was actively involved for, for many, many years. Um, as a trustee, it's a point of pride to be invited you know, in this celebration because this is a beautiful uh, campus, beautiful college, and, and actually I took a class here when there were still uh, portables here. Um, so um, it, you know, it goes back that far. Um, but the convocation is always a day of hope and great expectations for the coming year. For those of you who are new to uh, Folsom Lake uh, College, uh, congratulations and welcome. I hope you become one of those uh, true falcon life that you want to live. But um, school years come and go, but uh, our commitment to our students never fades. It never wavers. So thank you for all of your hard work, passion, and perseverance. And, and when I, you know, um, see all the work that you do, you know, reminds me of a comment from William Ward, um, that mediocre teachers tell, the good teachers explain, the superior teacher demonstrates, the great teacher inspires. And Rachel's always talked about the inspiration that you have, and I think all of you, you know, have that um, great teacher mentality, uh, and so you will continue to uh, inspire everybody. Uh, and now please join me in welcoming our Chancellor, Brian King, to present his portion of the Fall 2006 Convocation. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. It is wonderful to be with you today, and I want to acknowledge the members of our district office leadership team who get to hear this for the fourth time. As some of you know, we start the day at CRC, then we go to Sac City, American River, and then we save the best for last. So here we are, and let me acknowledge uh, Jamie Nye, Associate Vice Chancellor, our General Counsel, J.P. Sherry, Associate Vice Chancellor Mitchell Benson. And I saved Sue for last because I know, you know she gets such a good welcome. Yeah. Sue Lorimer, our Deputy yeah. Chancellor. Yeah. And I want to invite my wife, Christina, to come here for a second. Come here, Christina. Hey. It is amazing to think that this is my fourth fall convocation. 
in Los Rios. It's, it's hard to believe that we've been here that long. And just to get a sense of how quickly time passes, our daughter Celia was a freshman when we moved here. That's right. She was sure we were ruining her life. And now she's a senior, just about a mile away. So she's finishing her senior year. So thank you for helping our family make this transition so smoothly. Thanks for all you do. And Celia is at school, at least her phone is. I looked on Find My iPhone, so. <laughs> this technology. I have been looking forward to today for more than a year, because last year at this time, you recall, we were talking about getting through the accreditation process, reaccrediting our colleges, and then developing a strategic plan. So a lot of energy uh, coming into today to put together that plan and pivot to the future. And on May 11th, Trustee Knight and the other trustees approved our new strategic plan. And that's really remarkable that we went through the accreditation process in the fall, didn't miss a beat in January and started on a strategic plan. And with hundreds of men and women from all four colleges across the district, we were able to successfully complete our next strategic plan. So give yourselves a round of applause. Last year at this time, we were getting ready for the visits from our site teams for accreditation. How many of you were involved in accreditation in one way or another? Raise your hand. That's pretty much everybody. Let's celebrate for a second. All four of our colleges were fully accredited. And we're not just involved in our own accreditation. Our district is very involved in leadership efforts statewide to improve the accreditation process. And if you have an interest in that, if you go to the Community College League of California website, there is a lot of information about efforts to improve accreditation. And I do regular updates on behalf of the CEO board for the state. So we will, after convocation, do what we do each year. We'll send you an email that has links to the different topics we discuss. So you'll have a chance to dive in deeper if your schedule allows. So we use the recommendations and commendations from accreditation to inform our strategic planning process. And two themes were consistent in all the groups that were involved in planning the strategic plan. One, no surprise, accountability. An understanding that there's a greater pressure to be accountable both to our students and also to our community. And at, at uh, Folsom Lake and Los Rios, there's an embracing of that accountability. There's an understanding that accountability is, is increasingly important. And not just to say we're accountable, but to measure it and have standards so we can see that we're doing the things that we need to be doing. Another consistent theme with every group involved in strategic planning, the question was, are we in a business as usual mode or do we really need to be pushing the edge? And you won't be surprised to know. Every group said this is not status quo, that we've gone through many changes in the last several years and more changes are coming. So we have to be willing to push the edge and do things differently. A couple of statistics under, underline how important it is to be responsive and be open to change. Our students are changing. You see that. You, you see in the classrooms and everywhere we go across our colleges that our students are changing. And right now, 60% of our students come from historically underrepresented groups. So we have a very diverse, dynamic student body. And uh, as an example, Latino enrollment district-wide in 2011, we were under 20%. By the fall of last year, we were up to 25%. So you see in a, in a fairly short time, the makeup of our students is changing. And the needs are changing, too, and we're responding to those needs through our plan. It's exciting to be a part of higher education that looks most like the community, our sector, community colleges. We look more like the community we serve than any other part of higher education. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Our students look like our community. So we were fully accredited in January and started the strategic planning process. We made that pivot to developing a new strategic plan. And we provided with you the five goals. You have a single page handout. If it's OK, I thought I would read all five of those slowly. Would that be? I'm just kidding. <laughs> In the time we have together today, we're going to focus on really the backbone goal of the five. The first goal, establish effective pathways that optimize student success and access. So goal number one is emphasizing that helping our students do better and providing access to more students are not competing goals, they really are the same goal. That we uh, know that our challenges in recent years involving enrollment have been significant. And we shared with you, we've always been very transparent about enrollment, and on July 15th, we shared with you that for the first time in our district's history, 
we have gone into stability, and it's been headline news. You may have seen an article in early August in the Sacramento Bee. I want to share with you what we view as the headlines involving enrollment. We need to reach more students who need us. That is at the heart of access, that we know there are, are, are men and women and boys and girls in our region who need exactly what we're providing. So we need to find those students. And last year to this year, we are down about 4% compared to last fall. So we need to continue asking why that is and what we can do to help find more students find their way to our colleges. Stability funding, I mentioned, is a new term at Los Rios. It's not that new for many colleges, but stability means when the state has agreed to fund us at a certain level based on students we serve, if you do not meet that enrollment target, you're held harmless for one year, so your funding is not reduced. That's what stability funding means, and that's where we are for 2015-16, the year just completed. I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse, but we're certainly not alone in enrollment challenges around the state. Half of the districts in the state of California either are in stability, as we are for last year, or in restoration, which is the year after stability, where you have some time to regrow enrollment and increase access. From a financial standpoint, we, we're losing millions of dollars that would help us serve more students by, by not connecting with the students who need us. So last year, we were held harmless, so our funding isn't reduced. But if we had served more students, we would have had more dollars to benefit our students. So all of these efforts ultimately focus around serving our students better and having more resources to serve our students better. And I think you all know this is not new. We've been aware that enrollment was changing around the state for the last few years, so we've been very active in getting our leadership together. And we had a special cabinet meeting on August 1st earlier this month. And cabinet at Los Rios involves leaders from all four of our colleges and the district office and all of our constituent groups. And we had a very robust discussion about what we've done so far and what we need to do differently together moving forward. And the theme was pretty straightforward. It's not the time to panic. We want to be calm, but we want to be thoughtful. And this is not just a faculty issue or just a student services issue. All of us need to be looking at what we can do together to address the enrollment challenges. So we need everybody. So we had the cabinet meeting and our board, Trustee Knight and the other board members in July, spent really the entire board member exploring what we have done so far, the many, many initiatives already in place, and what we're going to do differently moving forward to uh, provide more access. We'll continue to market our classes and our programs, and we're going to explore new tools that will provide resources to do things differently. And a lot of examples come to mind, but the one I'm going to share with you today is the Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative, IEPI. And we're the first multi-college district in the state that filed a joint application for these resources. We'll get $750,000, 150 for each of the colleges and the district, for a unified effort on enrollment management. And the money's good. It's always nice to have that money. But in addition, the IEPI program provides teams of peers from other colleges who serve and come and get a fresh perspective on what we're doing in terms of enrollment management. And the example that comes to mind for me, any of you coach your own kid? Have you ever had that experience? A couple of years ago when my son was in eighth grade, I coached his undefeated 10 and 0. It doesn't have anything to do with the story, but I, I like saying that. His 10 and 0 basketball team. And the best thing for me to give direction to my son is to have someone else say it because my voice is familiar. And I think the IEPI process is like that. It's not that we don't have great insights and great voices within our colleges, but when we can have a different voice and someone from the outside, in some cases say the same thing, it is a good opportunity for us. And IEPI and the efforts that we are going to implement in the coming months are all about our students and helping our students be successful. So at first glance, it might seem like the news about enrollment and the strategic plan are that enrollment discussions could be a distraction from the strategic plan, but it really is the same discussion. Back to that first goal of our plan, establishing effective pathways both for student success and for student access. It's not an either or, it is a both and. And in terms of pathways, the focus on pathways, the concept is easy to understand that if a process is complicated and sometimes convoluted, having a straight path makes a lot of sense, right? Are you with me on that? 
What does it mean in community colleges? How many of you have read Redesigning America's Community Colleges? It's a book that's received a, a lot of attention nationwide because the concept, summarized very well by the president of Valencia College, my friend Sandy Sugart, Sandy said, we must move from a culture of chaos to one of clear design and support with more limited choices and more secure outcomes for students. Doesn't say no choices, but more limited choices to secure their outcomes. So who would like a copy of this book? Who would be interested in having a copy? Now, a lot of times I give to somebody on the front row, so let's go to the top. And while I'm working my way up, we're going to go all the way to the top. Will you raise your right hand? <laughs> Say, I promise to read the book. I promise to read the book. And I agree to participate in an online discussion about the book this semester. That's too many words. And Just I say, yeah, I do. Yes, I do. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's cool she got a free book, right? Yeah. But it's not cool you didn't get one. So here's the deal. If you want a copy, we have 150 copies. And this is the fourth group we've spoken to. So about 100 have been claimed, if not more. So don't do it right now. Listen for a couple more minutes. <laughs> But as soon as we wrap up, and after Rachel is completed too, don't be emailing me while Rachel is speaking, <laughs> but send me an email that uh, you'd like a copy of the book and you agree to participate in the conversation. So my email is pretty easy to remember. I'm not the queen bee. It's king bee <laughs> at losrios.edu. So send me an email. We'll get you a copy of the book. Three specific thoughts about pathways, preparing students, guiding students, then redesigning programs. So preparing, guiding, redesigning. For preparing, we can't do this alone, that if we're not communicating very closely with our K-12 districts and also with our four-year college university partners, we're not going to have students be successful. So one of the best ways to have greater success in college is to have students who come to us ready to succeed. And it's no one's fault that so many times the ecosystem of education is not aligned well where we're a large metropo metropolitan region. One school district may be doing one thing, another may be doing another, and even within our district, sometimes a great program will be happening at one college and it's hard to get that infrastructure to share good ideas. So when you think about what's going on in the Olympics, being in the boat together and rowing and being in alignment makes all the difference if you want to head in the right direction. And for the crew, if you want to get there more quickly, you have to be coordinated and aligned. And money doesn't hurt. I'm uh, very excited to share with you that we learned this summer that our region has one of only five grants statewide for the Basic Skills Pilot Partnership. And we're partnering with Sierra College, so this goes across college district boundaries. We're partnering with school districts in both Sacramento County and Placer County, so we're cutting across county boundaries, and also partnering with Sac State University. So it's a great example of this regional approach and having everyone together to make sure we're rowing in the right direction together. Out of that $2 million for Los Rios, about $400,000 will go to professional development, which will give us a chance to get faculty from our colleges together with high school faculty and faculty from Sacramento State to make sure that we're in alignment for basic skills and math. And I think that framework will serve us very well for other topics as well. Align Capital Region is a brand new regional organization. How many of you have heard of Align Capital Region? Maybe, maybe a few have. Our district is involved in the leadership of this new backbone organization. And that $2 million grant is an example of how we will use this new regional organization that will bring together people from all the organizations. And the cool thing is, We'll have people involved in Align Capital Region who are not direct recipients of the grant, but will be interested in the learning that goes on. So we want to change the whole culture. So we're not competing against each other for grants. Anytime anybody gets a grant in the region, it's a learning opportunity for everyone. And another focus for preparing students is promise programs. And I don't need to tell you about promise programs, do, do I, that uh, Folsom Lake has been successful in developing a promise program. And on August 30th, Los Rios is going to have the largest number of people from any district in the state of California attending a Promise Conference in Oakland. So we are moving really aggressively to expand our capital region Promise programs. 
And Rancho Cordova was the first city to step up with $100,000. That's worth a line of applause for the city of Rancho Cordova. The Folsom Lake College uh, Promise Program. West Sacramento, Mayor Christopher Cabaldon has, has proposed $500,000 on an initiative in November that would help a Promise Program that would involve Sacramento City College. The newly elected mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg, is very interested in the Promise concept, so I have no doubt that uh, ARC, CRC, and Sac City will be engaged in a promise with the city of Sacramento. The county is interested, and businesses. We're being very aggressive in talking to our business partners about the need to support the Promise efforts. So the money is great. Having scholarship money for a Promise program is great, but the alignment is at least as important. And in some ways, scholarships make people interested in the Promise program, that's good, but when you have everyone together, it's a chance to talk about how to improve alignment. So preparing students, first part of Pathways, guiding students once students are coming our way. And uh, one of the things we can do is streamline and simplify processes from the first contact to the first day of class. How many of you have applied for a class in our district or our college? How many of you found it easy? It's not easy. It, it, there are things we can do to make it better. And underlining uh, why, looking at our students again, almost half of our students are the first in their family to go to college. So even if we can navigate the process, we need to think about it from the eyes of someone who may not have the experience of applying before. So making those processes more streamlined. And last year, more than 6,000 students, 6,500 students, attended more than one of our colleges. So making the process to go from college to college easier will become increasingly important. So when I think about how these things happen, how many of you have a garage that's not as clean as you'd like for it to be? <laughs> so a lot of garages look like that. And if you look in that picture, there's some cool stuff in there. You know, you get something, you put it in the garage. And uh, how many of you have gone to Costco and Christina will chuckle at this. I went for a gallon of milk once, and I came back with an ocean kayak. <laughs> Anybody else had that experience? You go for one thing, and you put it in the garage, and it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with what's there, but it becomes cluttered at some point. Anyone's garage look like this? Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't, that's not my garage, I want to, I want to let you know. But the thought is that making things easier to find and in the intake process to the first day of class, cleaning up things that are good, they've grown over time, but making it work better for our students. The second area in guiding students involves high school students and convincing more high school students, and it's not just the students, right? It's also parents and counselors that attending one of our colleges is a smart choice. Here is a blog from a high school student about smart choices. And Madison Sykes is the student, and she is going to enroll at Folsom Lake. And I am really happy to say she's with us today. Will you stand and say hello? And her mother, Terry. So Madison, thank you for letting me share your story and what she posted on her blog. The theme is one that you probably recognize from other high school students. She had opportunities to go to many colleges and universities. She did very well in high school, but it was a smart choice for Madison and her family to go to Folsom Lake College. So she's proud to announce that she's going to attend Folsom Lake College in the fall. What do you think was the response from her peer group and from parents, teachers, and counselors? Really? You're too smart for that. Don't waste your time on that. Let's say boo. boo. It's wrong, but we know it's a perception that's out there. And I love what Madison said about, I'm not too smart for my choice. I'm smart because of my choice. Yeah. Stand up again, Madison. It is a smart choice, right? And we're going to show Madison and her mom and her friends how smart a choice it is. And I, I look forward to all of you reaching out to her when you see her and help her 
continue her path. So the third part of Pathways is redesigning programs. And faculty, I'm talking to you. When we talk about redesigning programs, you are at the heart of the programs, and we have great programs, but we need to look at our programs differently sometimes. Mm -hmm. Many times we're looking more at individual courses, and the need is to look at, at complete programs. So the uh, gold standard would be guiding student choices without restricting options. So we want students to have options. It's not one path for everyone, but they need guidance in getting on a path and staying on that path. And the good news is we have examples of wonderful successes of Pathways already. So Pathways is not some new gimmick or some new program. Pathways is a way of structuring the work we already do. One example is our associate degree for transfers. Students come to us and then are able to go directly to a CSU with the ADT. And our career technical education programs are great examples of Pathways and a very clearly defined program that students can complete within a certain amount of time if they stay on track. So thinking about how we can implement Pathways, going from that big concept of the road through the maze to very specific things we can do, one example would be encouraging every student who is able to take one more class. If every student enrolled who is able took one more class, that would be transformative for Folsom Lake and for our district. How many of you saw the woman's 400 meters? She really wanted to get to the finish line, didn't she? So when you're committed to getting to the finish line, you're able to do more than you possibly thought you could do and also educate us all about what it means to finish a race. For our students, this is the finish line. Graduation for students who want a degree is the finish line. So helping them get to the finish line is more important in their lives in many ways than winning a gold medal. And this slide has a lot of information, so I'll try to summarize. The point is that when every year you spend in college after the, the prescribed time, means that you will, yes, you got your hand in the air. I feel like I need to, to see what you want to say. It's a nice thing, it's a nice thing. You know Allison Felix? Mm -hmm. She is the niece of one of our faculty, well, now retired faculty from CRC. Okay. So there's a connection. Okay, awesome. Now, I don't know if everybody, can you say that one more time so everybody can hear? Yes, Melvina Jones. Melvina Jones. Right. <laughs> she was a dean who ascended the faculty. And, and that is her niece. Allison so Felix on the right. Allison uh, Felix, tall shuggy for us, who played with my daughter. <laughs> well, there you go. I did not know that. So thank you for sharing. So a connection. Now, I, would, I, I thought you were going to say you couldn't read this slide, and there was nothing I could do about that. <laughs> there is a lot of information, and the point is that every year that you're in college beyond the, the time that you hope to be is very expensive in terms of time and money. The direct costs we know, and for community colleges, our fees are not high, but still there are costs for books, classes, your living expenses. The opportunity cost is what really racks up. So every year that you don't have that degree over your lifetime adds up to a really big number. And for our students, we have to pay a lot of attention to that because we know about 43% of our students either are low income or poverty. So when we talk about the lifetime cost of an extra year in college, that's a really big number. $147,000 for every year, every extra year that you're in college with the direct costs and the opportunity costs. We want to be about opportunity, not opportunity costs. And you have my email, so before you fire me that email saying, it's not all about the money, I want to tell you, I absolutely emphatically degree, agree that it's not about degrees. It's not all about the money. It's also about having a fulfilling career. It's about having a meaningful life and being a participating citizen in our democracy. But you're not going to be any of that without what? A job. So it's not either or again. We want students to be well-rounded, but we want them to have a good economic future. So in a pathway, having students full-time, what is a full-time student? How many units a semester for federal financial aid? 12 for federal financial aid. That's not on time to graduate. I'm not great at math, but if I'm taking 12 units for two semesters a year, 
How many am I going to complete in two years? 48, not 60. So 12 really is not full time in terms of completion. You look at national community college numbers, about 30% of community college students complete 24 units a year in 2015-16. Uh, so about three out of 10. That's na nationwide. What do you think the Los Rios percentage of students is who completed 24 units 2015-16? Are we better than the national average or lower? 12%. So we're substantially lower. We have room to improve the percentage of students completing 12 units a, a semester and 24 units a year. So one more class. We have a significant number of students who could be at 24 if they took one more class a semester. And the ultimate goal for students who want to complete in two years would be 30 units a year. So 30 units a year. And again, looking at the national numbers, only about 27% of all college students are taking 30 units a year. If you look at community colleges nationally, about 11% of community college students are comp completing 30 units in 2015-16. How do you think we did? Are we better or worse? Unfortunately, only about 4% of our students completed 30 units. So I would stipulate that 100% of our students are not in a position to take 30 units a year. But I think you'd be hard pressed to come up with an argument we couldn't increase pretty substantially. And it would benefit our students, too. One of the concerns with students taking more classes is, is that they, they may not succeed. But there's a growing, overwhelming body of research that the vast majority of students do better when they're taking more classes. So we have to find that right mix. So one more class, more students on time, dual enrollment and advanced ed are other opportunities with high school students. And the next year, we're going to build that dual enrollment program here in Folsom Lake and throughout the district. So more high school students can be taking classes while they're in college. And we need to do education about AP versus dual enrollment, that advanced placement. There are, is the perception many times that AP is, is wonderful. But as you know, dual enrollment, dual enrollment courses automatically advance where AP may or may not. So all three of those areas are things we can do together. So in uh, guiding student choices, redesigning our programs, we've talked about the associate degree for transfers. We've talked about career technical education. And really good news this year, we have $5 million in addition as a district to expand some of our uh, continuing uh, career technical education programs. And I want to close with a number that is more positive. It's very positive. Some of these numbers give us cause for concern, and hopefully are a catalyst for action. But associate degree for transfers are a huge success. What percentage of our transfer students do you think finish in two years without an associate degree for transfer? So a student has a, a completed a degree and they transfer, but it's not an ADT. The success rate is about 50% over two years, which is not bad. But with an ADT, 85% of our ADT transfers are not just completing, they're completing within two years. So it is just powerful evidence we know how to do this. We know how to build pathways that work for students. And when the pathway is there, it leads to on-time completion for our students. So pathways are not something we don't know how to do. We just need to do more of it and do it better. 85%. How about a round of applause for 85%? <laughs> now, I know that in my presentation, sometimes it sounds like a lot of statistics that can be overwhelming and all these big ideas take time to do and you're ready to be, be through with convocation and start preparing for classes Monday. I get that. I spent a lot of time in the classroom and you do make a difference in the work you do in the classroom. But I want to close with the story about how one person really can make a difference and things that may seem small can have a tremendous impact. Recognize this? Have you seen those? What is it? parking uh, slip, so it cost $2 to get one of these. And on August 5th, a woman, a student at Sac City posted this story, and I want to close with this and hope I can get through it without getting too emotional because it moves me to share this. I'll, I'll read what she posted on the, the site Love Matters. We'll share this link with you as well, and you could go and post comments on this site. Here's what she wrote. I tried to go to college once when my, when my daughter was two, I was told by my ex I couldn't do it and I would be neglecting my daughter. So I gave up. 
Now my daughter is five and I went to college to do my assessment testing. That was just this month on August 5th, as the parking uh, slip says. The whole way there I kept hearing his voice. I kept hearing his voice in my head telling me those things again. I got to the parking lot and I found out they only take cash for the permit. His voice got to me and this older lady just knew it. She walked over and started talking to me. Think about that as you pull into the parking lot on Monday with our students here. She went out of her way to get me to the testing room, so she went that extra mile. She bought the parking pass and helped her to the assessment. Here's what her student says. It was the best thing in the world she could have done. A complete stranger saved me from giving up again. And she writes, I will always hold on to this parking permit to remind me that a complete stranger had faith in me and that I can do this. That a past voice will not control my life anymore. That's why we're here. So I appreciate you letting me spend some time with you today. Think about that on Monday, how uh, the little things can make all the difference. Thank you.